Agradu, ak môžem? Do I need to use this or not? Do you want me to stay here? Whatever, whatever you wish. <laughs> Professor Jha, Professor Narahari, my friend Mr. Gop, Professor Gopinath, and many distinguished scholars here, yeah, Professor Ram Subramaniam, Srinivas, and so on. Well, I first of all want to congratulate uh, the ICPR, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, and the people here at the Institute of Science and Elsewhere who have taken this initiative to run something like this, a course like this. Um, I think something like that is badly needed because our educational institutions, especially the ones in science and technology, with a few very notable exceptions, IIT Gandhinagar comes to my mind first, IIT Bombay, usually avoid these subjects. I'm sorry to say this campus is one such, but they now run one of the undergraduate course that we have which I think is a, is a step in the right direction. Now I am um, flattered that uh, in a meeting which is organized by the uh, Indian Council for Philosophical Research asks me to open this meeting and I must tell you, I must confirm that it is a hobby for me. I am not a great scholar, there are many great scholars here in this audience. Um, my view is a um, little bit more that of a scientist, I'd say a working scientist, has wondered about why today, for example, much of science is something which, um, let's see, it's actually, that's why I prefer this, so that it doesn't matter if I do or not. Huh? This one. Yeah, that's what I also prefer. I don't want to stay in one place. It's on. No, it's on. Okay. And can we switch this off? Yeah. So that it doesn't. Okay. <clears throat> so, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so it, it is really a hobby for me, but a hobby which I love, that, was, that also I must say. And um, well, when I was the age of many of the young people here, I see, I also used to read novels and fiction and so on. But once I started looking at this issue, it sort of caught hold of me. And so now I get uh, more relaxation reading or doing something about these than anything else I can think of. <coughs> well, the theme of what I'm going to say at the request of the organizers of the meeting 
is about computational positivism. And um, I want to tell you why I got interested in this very briefly. Uh, because it was something which uh, came up as uh, well, it particularly had to do with my visit to the United States for my PhD. And I saw that, uh, well, there are people there from all over the world, all of them smart. However, the countries are not all equal in the world stage. You ask, you ask yourself, how come people are intelligent all over the different countries of different histories and different positions in the world now? If you look at, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, what I want to do is actually um, sort of give a very broad brush view first of what's happened in the world. Because I think it helps us to appreciate why countries are different. Secondly, um, why the world of science is roughly what it is today and why a knowledge of what happened in the past here and elsewhere might help us to look at the future in a different way. So, if you today take a course in science or engineering, anywhere in this country, or almost anywhere in the world, but certainly in this country, the names you hear are the same as uh, anywhere in the West. Galileo, Descartes, Newton, Laplace, etc., etc., etc. Okay, those are the heroes. In fact, most of them are from Europe. There are, of course, now more and more people from the United States, a few from Japan. But otherwise, it's all very Western. And the same thing with technologies. Whether it's aircraft or automobiles or integrated circuits, they all come from there. And you say, how come? How come this is so concentrated on this globe? No names from anywhere else in the world. But then you begin to notice something. The names that you hear, even from the West, fall into two groups, two ages. One, in ancient Greece. You hear about Euclid. Um, you hear about Ptolemy, Aristarchus. You also hear about Pythagoras, a theorem attributed to him, which he really did not, as far as there's no evidence that he either made the theorem, let alone prove it. But you hear those names, and then there's a large gap. After that, there are no names from Europe or the West. Till um, around 300, 400 years ago. And many of the names I listed there are all from the last few centuries. Now that period has been known as the Dark Ages in Europe. There was nothing very creative done. That's about 1,400 years there. So um, European views of what happened in the world, Western views of what happened in the world, have been dominated by this area, the Dark Ages, the Greece, uh, the Greek thing, and uh, later on, the European the miracle. It, it's really a miracle what happened in Europe. And it's highly worthwhile for us to see what happened there. I, I'm, I'm not going to go into that a great deal. Here are two views. Both were very highly respected uh, scholars. Karl Popper in Austria and England, you can say. And uh, if you look at what he says here, well, it was in Greece that a tradition that admits a plurality of doctrines, all of which try to approach the truth by means of critical discussion. Okay. Now he credits Greece with it. But those who know about how argumentative Indians are, and many people have written about it, we all know it. In fact, these Vadas and uh, Pratiwadi Bhayankaras and so on <laughs> have been known in Indian tradition for a long time. I uh, find it hard to believe that that's actually only in Greece that it happened. Our attempts to see and to find truth are not final, open to improvement. Our knowledge, our doctrine is conjectural, etc., etc. I want you to keep this in mind because I want to come back and say uh, what he seems to be describing as Greek here is very nearly what happened in India. Well, here is Thomas Kuhn, well known for his theory of revolutions in science and so on. 
And he said only the civilizations, the civilizations that descended from Hellenic Greece have possessed more than the most rudimentary science. So he dismissed the rest of the world. That is, in fact, the impression that uh, many Western scholars have. And that's impressed. that is the impression created in all of our minds as we go through school and college and so on in this country. But we also must admit that the bulk of scientific knowledge that as we see today is a product of Europe in the last four centuries. That is also true. What that incidentally shows is that the last few centuries in India have been our dark ages. I would say in the East in general, it's in the last few centuries that have not been as creative as we were at one time, which some scholars in the West as well as East realize. Of course, those of you who have heard me before have seen this uh, statement again and again and again. But uh, this is what uh, this British scientist Needham, a biophysicist actually, who uh, spent his uh, later years studying science and technology in China. And his uh, books fell a shelf. And uh, at the end, he said, you know, now we've been studying this. We've been studying what's happened in China and India. And the debate, the, the puzzle really, is why China and modern science did not come up in China and India. Okay, that's his puzzle. While they were ahead of Europe for 14 previous centuries. Okay. In those 14 previous centuries, which were the dark ages in Europe, they were the ones where these very interesting things were happening in India and China. And he said, why is it that modern science didn't come up in Patna or in Peking, but in Pisa, in Galileo's Pisa? Well, there are all these people. <coughs> um, in that recent thing I won't go through is in detail. Many changes occurred. But the interesting thing that I want to point out to you is Bacon. Well, that's about uh, 16th, 16th, 17th century. He was... Uh, he was severely critical of the Greeks. In fact, uh, <laughs> the adjectives he uses about the Greeks are almost unbelievable because we have been taught to think about the Greeks as uh, you know, the greatest thing, as you saw in the previous quotation, Kuhn and so on. And he says the Greeks are words, words, and words. Aristotle is a quack. Plato is full of words. You know, <laughs> we have lost. The Dark Ages, in other words, has been because of the Greeks. Uh, this, that's the implied thing. And he said, we have to change. And this desire for change in Europe uh, came partly because of their encounter in the East. Sometimes these were bloody encounters, like during the Crusades. And the first, um, uh, first uh, interlocutors were the Arabs. And the Arabs, of course, had um, been in contact with India and China. And so they represented a certain, language, a certain knowledge that came from there. And Greece was only just on the other side in Europe, and they learned from the Greeks as well. So around that time, they were really the ones who knew what you can say the world knew. And Bacon was severely critical of the Greeks and said, we have to change the way we look at knowledge. Um, I can argue that in greater detail, but I do think that it was actually triggered by an encounter with the East. Um, at a time when, you know, uh, the 1,400 years um, at the Dark Ages were beginning to lift. And Bacon was one of the people who made that happen in science. Now, in those uh, European Dark Ages, there are all these other people in India. I won't do a few names. You can multiply them a great deal. I take Charaka because, uh, well, we have in medicine uh, some very interesting things about how one should do science. Aryabhata. And there are all these people that uh, you're familiar with. Brahmira, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, Mahavira. And then the Kerala people, Madhava, Nilakantha, and so on. Now, in the Dark Ages, um, if you say that India was doing something great, there will be a lot of people in this country who will say, uh, you know, Let's not talk about the glorification of the past. This is not about a glorification of the past. This is about trying to understand what actually happened. 
Now, there's no doubt, and the Arabs themselves say it, uh, you know, many, many Indian books were translated there. al Khwarizmi said, uh, where he wrote a book on calculating with Indian numerals, Hindu numerals, as he said. Fibonacci, who wrote a book also, uh, you know, translated one of those, and uh, he introduced Indian numerals and Indian calculations there. Numero Indorum, as you can see. Um, he's the same Fibonacci as of the Fibonacci numbers, but they were known in India before him. I don't know how many of you heard um, what is Manjul Bhargava. He gave a lecture here. It's probably on YouTube. If you haven't done it, I would strongly uh, recommend to you that you should do it. And though he introduced, uh, well, there was uh, Professor, uh, you know, Gopinath talked about music and ragas and talas and so on. And he was talking about drums and mathematics. And he could play on the drums too. And he said, um, well, the Hemachandra numbers uh, called in India the Fibonacci numbers, he said. I see, so we, we don't even know what actually happened in this country very much. Uh, the, here was a history of uh, global science, sorry, uh, as known at that time by Sal Andalusi. And he said eight peoples have interested themselves in the sciences. Hindus, the Persians, etc., etc., Greeks, Romans, Arabs. The premier nation among them is that of the Hindus. Now that was the view at that time. Al-Biruni found that the Indians were very arrogant, complacent, wouldn't tell you what they knew, but they think there is no art like this, no religion like this, no science like this. But in fact, whatever he could find out, he described very interestingly in his book. And even in technology, you can say there were various things. And the Chinese have a whole series of inventions. And you see, all of these came in those European dark ages. So what was dark in Europe? was shining in the East. That's really the main point I want to make. Is there only one way of doing science? You read Kuhn, for example, it will seem as if there's only one way. That is the way that the Greeks did it. Although some of what he attributed to the Greeks were also done by other people in the world, other civilizations in the world. But look at what some people who are most sensitive to what happened in the world, outside Europe, outside the West, have a different view. Now here is Feynman. Feynman says, well, there are two ways of doing physics. You know, not just one, as the other people seem to, him seem to imply. The Greek, from first principles axioms, and the Babylonians, relating one thing to another. Once again, I want you to remember these words. Now Feynman, I think there was probably the greatest physicist of the second half of the 20th century. And he had this other interest, and he kept talking about it. He always talked about it in direct terms. And, um, and he had a view of his own. Now, it does not represent the standard Western view. And he said, I am a Babylonian. I have no preconception about what nature is like or ought to be. What he's doing is accusing the Greeks that they had preconceptions. Well, the world had to be perfect. If there was a creator whom Plato called Demiurge, he can't make something imperfect. Therefore, everything had to be perfect. And uh, the curves had to be perfect, the calculations had to be perfect, symmetry. So, so the circle was the most perfect figure for them. And if you wanted to describe the heavens, circle is what you need. How could Demiurge have done anything which was not as beautiful or as symmetrical as the circle? That kind of thinking was uh, very common. Plato, a very highly respected philosopher, said, um, well, you know, if you want to do astronomy, not astronomy, any knowledge, but uh, let's take astronomy for example. He said, um, you don't really have to observe. If you're smart enough, you can sit in your room, lock yourself up, and deduce everything that happens in the skies and heavens. Now the Indians would just not have taken, the, the Indians would have considered it stupid. But for Plato, that was real philosophy. That was the way that you actually could actually do it. So, there is a picture. Both of these were at Caltech once, and uh, they're talking outside, well, they're outside on the, uh, 
know, in the courtyards, no, not in their offices. I have to make sure that I don't linger too much on this. There's a 20th century Babylonian who is Feynman with a 20th century Greek who is a, who is a Dirac. And you will be surprised at how different their views are. Dirac said, now you see, he reflected the Greek view. More important to have beauty in your equations than to have a, them agree with experiment. <laughs> it's just the opposite of what the Indians have been saying. In fact, well, there's a wonderful quotation here which defines, uh, which defines the theme of my talk, namely computational positivism. And I had not seen it before. I heard that Professor Iyengar actually was the one who suggested it, so I must thank him. This, is, this actually summarizes, summarizes what uh, I wanted to say. But for Feynman, that was not at all the way to go. Worship the phenomenon, he said, not the explanation. I don't tell nature what to do. Nature tells me, he said. So I, I observe nature, and I see what's going on. And a very great deal more truth can become known than can be proven. But that also goes back to the Greeks. For the Greeks, Euclid is the norm. You state axioms, and you prove theorem, provide logic. Anything else is second grade knowledge, sort of. But and that view is, cannot be sustained anymore. But it's clear that um, um, the other side has not only been seen, but in fact, in Feynman's own case, turned out to be extraordinarily effective. This again, those who have heard me before will have seen many times. But I think this summarizes it. I mean, I can tell you why this summarizes what happened, but I won't go into that in detail. But um, really, if you go back and see what triggered that extraordinary revolution that took place in Europe three, four centuries ago, if you trace it back, it was that the meaning of mathematics changed. As far as the Greeks were the dominant source of uh, knowledge and culture, um, as far as uh, um, they were the source, the Greek view was that, uh, you know, geometry, theorems, axioms, that, that was the basic thing. The, so once, so sometimes you can ask, how did they calculate them? Well, they learned the calculation from the Babylonians. I forgot to say that the Babylonians and the Indians are a bit alike in this. So when Feynman said he is a Babylonian, um, you could even have said, I'm like a bit like an Indian. But of course, the Babylonians were uh, the people from whom the Greeks learned to calculate. The key point is this. Number is logically prior to the concept of geometry. Okay. In uh, Greece, numbers, uh, sorry, um, geometry was the first. Numbers came later. Calculation. Anybody can make sort of view. In India, it was just the opposite. Numbers come first, okay? geometry comes later. And um, of course, that has been seen elsewhere too. And what's happened during the last 400 years in Europe is that they've shifted from the Greek view, thanks to people like Bacon, Francis Bacon and so on, to something which makes numbers primary. <clears throat> Okay, I'll now quickly go through. That's the sort of background. Um, many, many misunderstandings about what Indian science was like. And um, um, the people in, uh, the people who founded, the foundational authors in um, Ayurveda, for example, were very clear. In fact, you don't feel, science, feel see much about religion and God and so on in these books. Uh, although that's what we have been always usually told happens with Indian science. You see, Charka said there are three ways of doing medicine. Relying on God. You know, go on pilgrimages, prayers, and so on. Relying on yukti, diet, drugs, treatments. And then finally, conquest of the mind. He said, I'm going to do a, talk to you about yukti medicine. Okay. Uh, he did yukti medicine. And uh, Aryabhata and uh, Brahma Gupta and uh, Madhava and so on did Yukti astronomy. If you, if you look at what, what is driving force in the way they do it, that is actually Yukti. And it also comes here 
in this uh, quotation. Yeah, and he says Yukti is powerful. It can deliver for you all the three life goals, the Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, and Kama, but not Mukti, he said. But the other things you can do from Yukti. Well, I won't go into this in uh, great detail. Come back if uh, there are any questions. And um, ended up by saying, Sukham Samagram Vijnane Vimalecha Pratashtitam. All happiness is found in, on blemishless signs. Yeah. And you see, even the Shrutis are no reason for a belief that contradicts Yukti. You can see, therefore, the attitude was very rational. It doesn't say that the Shruti is nonsense. However, if there's a contradiction between Shruti and Yukti, Yukti wins. And that, of course, is an old Indian view. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's reflected in uh, Charaka, but it's also reflected in Manu and various other places. So that is, uh, yeah, and then authority is irrelevant. So these are all things which uh, were attributed uh, by Kuhn to the Greeks. Okay. And, but but uh, Indian Ayurveda is older than the Greeks. Now let's come to astronomy. Well, I start with uh, almost the most recent um, creative Indian mathematicians <coughs> in the Indic tradition, Nilakantra. So he produces this result attributed to Pythagoras. And uh, he ends by saying, Etat servam yukti mulam, natu agama mulam. Once again, yukti, skill, reasoning is what is primary. Agamas, they did not tear down the Agamas, that must also must be said. Nilakanta was actually quotes the Upanishads in other contexts. But he says when you're doing science, when you're doing astronomy, if Yukti contradicts Sruti, Yukti is what wins. <coughs> Siddhantas are not universal in time. I want uh, you to remember what uh, what Kuhn said, or sorry, what uh, mm. Popper said, <coughs> those two quotations I have, things which they attributed to the Greeks in terms of this attitude, actually very, very familiar in uh, Indian philosophy as well as in Indian science. Nilakanta says, you know, there are so many Siddhantas, but uh, he rank orders them, which are the best in terms of agreement with observation. And there is something which he attributes to, well, which is what which is the ranking given by Varavira in the 6th century, and two centuries later by Parashara, and you can see that the positions have changed. And some of them are actually, they contradict each other, and where that happens, you know, you have to make a new Siddhanta, you have to revise things. People have to get together, he says, the mathematicians and astronomers have to get together, and see how to make a new Siddhanta, or a new set of algorithms. Well, and here is another statement of his. Avidita Sarvashya Parikshayaya Sarvajnana. All that's unknown, you have to do Parik. Pariksha is a kind of special, meticulous, professional observation, so to speak. And knowledge is inference. You see, that's. Uh, You have to get it from inference. Observation and inference, you see. That is what uh, Indic science emphasized. That is also what our philosophical systems have emphasized. We have six systems, and all those systems except uh, observation, pratyaksha and anumana, observation and inference as a primary. Some of them have more, but all of them agree on the first two in any case. Therefore, knowledge of planetary motions is the same way. You observe and you infer. And that inference is tentative. It can change. Well, every hundred years or so, you have to take a look at it and uh, come to your conclusions. And he also describes to you how 
uh, a continuing tradition, a reliable and broken tradition can be set up. Once again, observation and computation. Mathematics. You see, just as mathematics meant sort of geometry for the Greeks, uh, for the Indians, mathematics meant number, computation and number. And uh, if you take a look at how Western science developed, the word arithmetic doesn't appear till about a thousand, well, it doesn't appear very much. And algebra, of course, this doesn't appear at all till around 1500, 1600. And then, over a period of 100 years, uh, mathematics became more and more algebra and arithmetic rather than geometry. And you can see the, you can see the transition that occurred towards algebra and numbers around that time. And that's why I think Eastern influence was very strong in the revolution that uh, followed. It was partly had to do with Francis Bacon once again. Well, here is this famous verse in uh, the Aryabhatiya where he says, you know, all this I presented to you in this book has come from um, has come from dredging gems on the ocean, the ocean of truth and falsehood. <laughs> I picked out these gems, okay, Swamati, my own mind, but the gift of Brahma. That's what he says. And somebody has misunderstood it. So Nirikanta tells him, yeah, this is a manda, a stupid fool. <laughs> he didn't say that he was, was revealed from Brahma. He only said Brahma gave him the mind which made him capable of looking at these truths, picking them out of that ocean of knowledge. Okay. Well, I've used the word uh, compu computational positivism. So what is positivism? But positivism is something which came up in uh, the late 19th to, and uh, lasted, let's say, till about the middle of the 20th century. And it was something which was uh, between the philosophers and the scientists. Science, of course, was uh, then at that time uh, had grown a great deal. And everybody had begun to see that uh, science in the 19th century, 20th century, had been something so far ahead of what our ancestors knew, <coughs> uh, they began to talk about exactly what science should be and uh, what its philosophy should be. And one very popular movement was that of what was called logical positivism. But there are many other positivisms as well. And here what they say, what they say. All knowledge must be based on positive data of experience. Experiences. Well, that is new. That's not what the Greeks said. But in India, that's been said for a very long time, not only by the astronomers and the medical scientists, but also by our philosophers. Bhartanari said, Swanabhuti Ekamana. Swanabhuti is the one standard. Beyond facts, said the Europeans, use only pure logic or pure mathematics. <coughs> well, there uh, they combine both logic and mathematics. And uh, one can argue about the logic of mathematics. But they were clear that theology and metaphysics were irrelevant. Animistic or anthropomorphic explanations ruled out. First cause, ultimate reality, shunned. Okay. Now, uh, to me, what happened in India was that uh, certainly the first was had been widely accepted for a long time. The second, if it were uh, exact science, like astronomy, would have included mathematics, numbers. They would not have gone to this extent of saying that it is irrelevant, theology and metaphysics, but it was kept separate. It did not interfere with the science you did. And if you were in doubt, Yukti actually triumphed. First cause, ultimate reality. I think many Indian uh, scientists had these two components in their mind. They also did philosophy on the side, but I don't think they let uh, those interfere entirely with the science that they were doing, which was uh, actually based very largely on Yukti. 
And in, uh, by the 20th century, the hierarchy in Europe had changed. They now put numbers first. Geometry next, mechanics third. So they had, they had layers in the hierarchy of knowledge. And the basic thing, the most fundamental thing, was numbers, they said. So that is already a shift in view which had occurred over the last few hundred years there. But that is very nearly what the Indians had been saying for a long time. But in the 20th century, scientists began to have more debates about, about what science was. Uh, incidentally, uh, Einstein and Mach. See, Mach, well, Mark is the same as, well, I, I think there are so many engineers here. Mach is the same Mach as the engineers look at, you know, especially in fluid numbers. Mach number, the same Mach. The same Mach had a deep interest in philosophy. He was actually a very unusual man. Uh, fluid dynamics and shock waves was only one thing he did. He also did uh, philosophy, psychology, and uh, many other things. <coughs> these were the these were the views that were characteristic of uh, uh, positivism in Europe. Anything that's not viable, verifiable, is useless. They say. All effects have causes. All events don't necessarily have causes, or we may not be able to talk about them. So causality was already beginning to be questioned a little bit. There was non-Euclidean geometry, so it's not as if there were only one set of axioms. Axioms could be different. You could have different kinds of axioms that have different kinds of geometries. Hilbert even went so far as to make very abstract spaces, which had only some characteristics. You have to be able to define a magnitude, define a distance, say a few things like that. And uh, it didn't matter then. It was not uh, geometry as we know it. It may be infinite dimensional geometry. Gödel's theorem on logic. There are truths not provable by logic. Okay. The system is not, any system of axioms is not complete. There are truths which are about the same subject, but not all contained in those axioms. And so, with the advent of quantum mechanics, many of these became common when the quantum mechanics people started saying waves are particles, you know, it can be a wave now, particle uh, some other time, or behave like a wave, behave like a particle. Uh, some of these certainties about, about what science was began to fade away. And by mid 20th century, I think something else had happened. So the logical positivism began to be analyzed. Mark, for example, incidentally, he made beautiful pictures of shock waves. And that was also at that time philosophical. Why? You could not see shock waves, okay? Observation, shock waves may occur, but you can't usually see shock waves. But uh, as I said, he was, he, was a very, he was a very, what do you call it, versatile man. So he set up optical and interferometer and, saw, and showed he took pictures of shock waves. He said, they're not seen, but here I'm showing pictures for you. So these, uh, incidentally, these all had, these all had uh, philosophical implications at that time. He was a severe critic of Newton, inspired Einstein. Helmholtz, in fact, you can see quite a few fluid dynamics people here. Uh, the, I did not put them in. It was actually that uh, at that time, fluid dynamics was actually a very challenging discipline before relativity and quantum mechanics and so on. And it is in some sense even today. But uh, they, they were also thinking about the philosophy there. Helmholtz, who did so much about sound and vortices and so on. Theories are things in themselves, not just instruments for prediction. Okay. Because pe people had said, the earlier positivists had said, there are no things in themselves. Kirchhoff, he said parsimonious description of observable phenomena. But he was too cautious to say that the parsimonious description is also an explanation. That's almost getting to the philosophy thing now. Okay. They didn't believe in atoms. You know, Mark heard a brilliant lecture by Boltzmann in Vienna. And when he walked out of it, said, I don't believe in atoms. <laughs> Poor Boltzmann already written down an equation two, three decades ago. Yeah, two, three decades ago. 
And then Sean Harvey described so many things which happened in gases. But he was uh, very severely criticized by many people for playing around with unreal things, the figments of the imagination like atoms. The, the criticism of Boltzmann was so severe that the poor man actually committed suicide. But two years later, two years after it committed suicide, Brownian motion was discovered. And another few decades later, you began to be able to see atoms and their role. And therefore, this is, it ceased to be a question. In a few decades, the situation had completely changed. And more revolutionary changes had taken place. What's happening? OK, now let's um, switch to Aryabhata and Indian astronomy. Well, if you, OK, one of the first things I did when I started getting interested in these was to look at the Aryabhatiya and Ptolemy. You keep them side by side, see what they're doing, how they're doing things. If you look at uh, Aryabhata, I, I just select, selected some headings from the Aryabhatiya, because I, I, I don't think this is the right time to go into any detail. Apart from, once again, an invocation to Brahma, First thing he talks about is writing numbers. It's clear, numbers is the thing. And then he talks about revolution numbers and so on. Time, Kalpa, Manu, etc. Planetary orbits, Earth's rotation, Earth rotates certain axis, he said. The epicycles, the Manda and Sigra, slow and fast, you can translate them as. But the slow is actually a mean, and the fast can be pulsating. Science, trigonometric functions. Here it is in one shloka. What, what uh, Ptolemy takes several pages. He has it in one shloka here, the science. This is, in, uh, this, is it, this is what it is in Sanskrit. And he describes to you this uh, very ingenious method he has of describing numbers by words. Because all of this had to be done in shlokas. Okay. All of this had to be done in shlokas. So here is a sign table in shlokas, an interesting thing in itself. And then um, he goes on. First turn, notational places. See, the decimal system, the Indian numeral system, is almost there. I mean, it's not, uh, there are no numbers in those shlokas. There are numbers, uh, you know, with the symbols that we have for the numbers. But it's clear the concepts are all actually there. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way he actually did it. And he talks about all these things, volume of, uh, sorry. Area of a circle, cube root, how to make cube roots, circumference diameter is pi, which he has correct to about four decimal places. How do you compute that sign table? And um, theorem attributed to Pythagoras. Series, sums of series, change terms, sigma square and squared and cube, trirashi, and so on. Now, the funny thing is, at the end of that book, what you see is uh, some, uh, I count more than 50 algorithms. Uh, so, he has only 120 shlokas. On an average, therefore, he has a new algorithm every two shlokas. Okay, something new to calculate. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of calculation procedures, all related to the positions of planets and so on, and uh, being used as he goes about that task. Indeterminate equations with infinite solutions. So 50 plus algorithms crowd that book. That's the nature you have. If you go to Ptolemy, his book is fat. Uh, it has uh, 13 books. And the first book is all taken with hypotheses, assumptions that he wants to make, the equivalent of Euclid's axioms, so to speak, for if you wanted to do astronomy. Uh, he says, the cosmos is spherical. Uh, the Earth is at the center. He also gives trigonometry, but uh, there were old tables done uh, much before him. Eclipses, stars, epicycles. Indians also used epicycles. Maybe got them from the Greeks. And geometric models. So the picture they had was that, uh, well, the universe is finite in the first place. Greeks had great trouble with the concept of infinity and also of zero. So it was one sphere. And um, 
But you could see the planets, and you could see the stars. So they have to explain how that could happen. Uh, they did not like the idea of a vacuum, because that was like also zero. It had to be filled with material. They said it had glass shells, spherical shells. And because the planets moved at different speeds, the spherical shells moved at different speeds, slid over each other, and so on. Now, it is a, it's a very detailed mechanical model. For them, it was very necessary to have that picture. Well, if you look at the Indian astronomers, they don't speak about these models at all. It's not that they don't have any idea about physically what happens. But that takes a place uh, that is uh, trumped, so to speak, by the ability to be able to predict. And from those calculations they make, and from other general arguments, they do talk about other things. They do talk about how motion is relative, absolute motion is not necessarily important. They talk about eclipses. Aryabhata talks about how you know that the Earth is round because of eclipses. He doesn't talk about the Rahu Ketu theory and so on. And um, for which he got into an argument with Brahmagupta. But um, you can see that this kind of detail the Indians would have rejected. Why are you saying all this? These are all stories, that's what they would have said. Uh, it's not that the Greeks didn't make uh, calculations, you had, they had to make them, but they were largely Babylonian, not their own. Of course, those theories about uh, those assumptions, we now know, almost all the assumptions that uh, uh, Ptolemy makes about the physical model are unreal, we know today, and wrong. And the first time that uh, the new revolution that had occurred in Europe showed that to be so. Uh, was with uh, Kepler and uh, uh, Copernicus. Tycho Brahe's comet, famous comet of 1577. It would have had to cut all the shells that uh, Ptolemy had in the universe. Well, that was not possible. And uh, the Ptolemy's picture more or less disappeared from the scene and was quickly replaced by the models that uh, came up there in terms of a heliocentric system with elliptic orbits and later on Newton's laws. Yeah, I make a contrast here. However, even Anivata does start, does, does, has to have to say something, does have to say something when he begins his calculations. He starts with an initial condition. When all planets are in conjunction, from 4.32 billion years ago, the date is specified. Planetary motions are decomposed into mean and rapid uh, epicycle, with corresponding epicycles. And they pulsate with a variable diameter. And this led to orbits, which were like past half ellipses. Okay? Sharp corners. I have a picture of it, I think, here. This is what is a bit like uh, uh, what was done. This was uh, the epicycles as uh, uh, Ptolemy took them. Uh, these epicycles, the planets moved here, but, uh, but the center itself moved around in this circle. It had to be all circles, you see. And that did not give him eccentricity, so he had to shift the center. And after a while, it gets very complicated. He has to do it differently for the moon, differently for the planets, one for the inner planets, one for the outer planets, and so on. Compared to all of that, the procedure that was followed uh, um, by Aryabhata and other astronomers were actually simpler. They were actually simpler than the very complex system that Ptolemy had made. But of course, Ptolemy also was pretty good. His results were, were not bad. They were actually pretty good, very good. But there's also a story about Ptolemy that he believed in his model so much that if in the end the observations did not agree with the model, he said there must be something wrong with observations. <laughs> Just once again, you, you can see how important for them it was to make those models and uh, how it was central to their belief in what happened. And in fact, Ptolemy has even been accused of uh, manipulating the data that he had so that they agreed with the models that he had made. 
Nevertheless, I don't, I don't want to, I want to, uh, you know, say that uh, that is not nonsense. It is ingenious. What they did was ingenious. There's no doubt about it. Okay, so, and uh, you can make, you can add some more here. Um, but the main objective was that calculations must agree with observation. Drugganidaike. See, that was the word that they used. And actually, they did extremely well. Partly because they kept, uh, they kept revising the algorithms. They, they saw that the theory they had was tentative. It was not forever and ever. Uh, they saw that uh, the calculations they were making needed corrections every now and then. They saw that because observation was primary and discrepancies could be noticed. And there were a variety of astronomers with slightly different procedures, so there were differences among them. And the first uh, critical survey of what, what uh, the uh, astronomers in India had been doing was made by Playfair. And we must say that Playfair was very honest. He found out that actually they were better than Ptolemy. This is now 1790. Um, and in fact, he says, agreements with Lagrange, only, you know, same century, as I said, are remarkable. Now, now, he says, observations made in India where all of Europe was barbarous and uninhabited, and those made in Europe 5,000 years afterwards, come in natural support. He in fact, he doesn't know how the Indians do this. How could he come, how could they have uh, formulas which are in exact agreement with what Laplace had done just 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 a few decades ago. So you can see that he is uh, he is amazed. He is amazed about how all of this happened. He couldn't explain it because it was not explainable by any system that he knew, and that would have been basically the Greeks and the developments that had taken place in the new European scientific revolution. He couldn't understand, we can't blame him. He had no exposure to this earlier at all. He couldn't understand that there was a totally different way of looking at it in India, which gave primacy to computations, calculations, and observations. And that agreement between them was exactly what they were driving at. And it's clear that they achieved it better than the other methods that were known to Playfair had done up to that time. <coughs> of course, this didn't last very long. This was 1790, but in another few decades, there was no comparison between the accuracies of our, of our uh, classical astronomy and um, what uh, was possible in Europe. Uh, there was an exponential increase, I would say, in the accuracy of the calculation. Although they might have been triggered by this move towards numbers as important, and not just geometry, that occurred around 1600. Yeah, so he wonders, how did this happen? Just as we wondering <laughs> in the last 200 years, how did that happen in Europe or not here? He wondered, how did that happen in India? He makes various hypotheses. First he says it may be chance, but it's not true. Then he says, maybe there was a Newton among the Brahmins, he says. Maybe even a Lagrange, you see. So that, that was the way that it was at that time. But he also says, yeah, they get all these values very well. But you know, they follow the rules without understanding its principles. They give no theory. Satisfy themselves with calculation. <laughs> OK. <coughs> well, there is some truth in it. I don't think it's completely true. But that, of course, was what um, that was the primary aim. It was not that there was uh, no theory entirely, but theory was not primary. It was not primary. And uh, it was not that there were no rules. You see, these calculations did have to be based on something. It was some kind of a model. But they were not committed to the model wholesale. Uh, as they found that observations changed, 
and uh, your calculations have to be uh, improved. Their uh, commitment to models was not like the commitment of Ptolemy to the models in his book one. There was, there was nothing of that kind at all. Indians would have had no hesitation in changing the model. Uh, but for the Greeks, that model was uh, the truth in some sense, truth and beauty. It was, it was the truth. Couldn't be anything else. And if it did not agree, it was a crisis in the West. If it did not agree, in India, well, you had to change it. You had to change it, sit down, and make a change. Buzzwords. If you look at the Greek books, Ptolemy, for example, axiom, proof, theorem, law, deductive logic, their version of deductive logic. I think uh, Professor Jha will talk about Naya uh, and so on in India. So I leave it to him to say that. Simple form, symmetry, perfection, beauty, models, assumptions. So that's the kind of thing that you see there. If you come to Indian text, it had to be, the Prajna had to be there in India. It had to be useful. Upaya, Yukti, Tantra, Anumana, Ganita, Nyaya, Tarka, Trivganita, etc., etc. Darshan Samadha, comparison with dialogue, comparison with what you see. Siddhanta. Siddhanta is not quite a theory. We use that word for a theory because we have no better word. Siddhanta is really, to me, the process conclusion. It's gone through a proper process of vetting and verification and so on. Samskaras and so on. Upapattis. Slatha is weakness. This, I think, is what constitutes computational positivism. This view, which puts um, algorithms, numbers, computation as one of the primary things. Next only to observation. Observation comes first. Next only to observation. In fact, as I had heard when I was a young boy that Indians were very poor at observation, all of this came to me when I first saw it as a revelation. I mean, how come? How come I learned that we were all actually very poor observers, but certainly our ancestors didn't seem to be poor observers, and they gave it first place. In philosophy as in science. <coughs> so, let's see. Done? I'll, I'll therefore conclude uh, very quickly. So you can say now, start said defining what that was really. It was a philosophical system that is implicit in the classical Indic approach to astronomy. The defining characteristics are that it confined itself to data of observation and experience. And the computation procedure are algorithms that yield agreement with observation. Rejects a priori models or theories in metaphysics. Not that they don't have think, they don't have models at all. They do have models. But the models don't come number one. Seeing them as at best a, an a posteriori construct to be derived from successful prediction schemes. It had to be consistent with uh, giving results, predictions which were in agreement with what you observed. More generally, highlight science as a parsimonious description of nature through algorithms. Okay. Aryabhata's algorithms are simpler than Ptolemy's algorithms. Use discrepancies between observation and algorithm as indicating need to revise or uh, tune algorithms or to search for better ones rather than as agents of philosophical crises. They have all the defining characteristics of a positivist philosophy centered around no more than observation of facts and computation with the only logic that is inherent in the use of numbers itself to be distinguished from the kind that is Aristotelian logic. Uh, a lot of Greek science was actually very greatly influenced by Aristotle's thoughts, which said 
Nothing and its contrary can be true at the same time. Well, that, first, it seems obvious to you. But uh, the Indians were very careful not to commit themselves to that uh, in philosophy or in science. Because words, words have meanings. Words have meanings which may not be able to describe what is happening. All the way from Sadasi, Nasadasi, 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 all the way to Buddhist thinking, right down to see when quantum mechanics happened. The business about waves and particles were something which were revolutionary in the West. Some Indians claimed we had been in quantum mechanics. Not true. It did not mean. However, we were not philosophically disturbed by it at all. Why? Well, we say, ah, that's the trouble with your names for it. Waves and particles. Why? Because you use those names for what you are familiar with, doesn't mean that it can't be this or the other. There's a famous story some of you will have heard about Yukawa, a Japanese physicist, first Japanese physicist, the first Japanese scientist to get a Nobel Prize. And somebody from the West, I've forgotten who it was, asked him, are you not confused by all these things about waves and particles? You can't tell whether it behaves like a wave or a particle depending on the situation. He says, no, I'm not surprised by it at all. You see, I didn't study Aristotle in school, he said. You can see how different the views on these things have been. <clears throat> and this is important to be distinguished from Aristotle in logic without any commitment to views in the scriptures or to anything like the Greek insistence on the notion of the perfect. And it worked for 1,400 years, very well, better than the other system. Now, this is the other thing. I mean, you have to read Bacon in order to get a rough idea of what the Greek, or how the Greek said, uh, you know, the, the weaknesses of Greek things are not easily uh, talked about a great deal. <clears throat> they were so carried away by Euclid that some scientists began to come to absurd conclusions. Just as in computing, we say, garbage in, garbage out. The same thing with logic, too, based on axioms. If the axiom is garbage, the conclusion is garbage. So they proved all kinds of things. But the word proof was sacred and was respected. So they proved like uh, the moon is half the size of the earth. All kinds of things based on, uh, based on axioms, which are clearly not, not valid at all. and uh, help trigger the European revolution of modern science. Then, however, I think that uh, what happened was that in India there was an underestimate of the potential power of fusing model with algorithm it's really what Newton did, so to speak. We, of course, know that Newton's laws are not absolute truth either. <coughs> I'll end with just a few comments about what might happen. <coughs> now, uh, let's see, we have five minutes? Yeah. Um, very quickly. Uh, there is Stephen Wolfram, who wrote a book in 2002 saying a new kind of science. <clears throat> and his new kind of science is all his computation, you know, the red thing there. He's saying now we have computers, we can compute anything. Whether you have a model, whether you have a theory or not, really doesn't matter. Uh, he's also the author of uh, uh, many who use computers with no mathematical program. Incidentally, he was a Caltech graduate. And he left Caltech because uh, the views he expressed at that time were not, uh, were not very appreciated by his uh, colleagues. And they did not like uh, somebody setting up a company to sell his code. <laughs> so he says, this can even be done without equations. Simple rules are better than, are going to be more effective than all these other things that we have. And simple rules may have very complex behavior. 
This is true. The rule seems so absurdly simple. You think that everything is simple. It's not simple at all. The richness of uh, the results that you, get, you can get from simple rules is huge. Well, I was going to spend some time to show you an example, but I don't have time. Now, he, he, for example, this is just a quick example. With very simple rules about what you do with three cells and the colors which you locate in them, there are here all these rules. You can get a picture like this, a picture like this, very ordered, picture like this, sort of chaotic, a picture like this, partly ordered and partly chaotic. He computed the flow past a circular cylinder, okay, using just these rules. Set up an automaton and using those rules. Okay, let me skip all of that. Computers prove that is the thing. This is the last slide, I think. So today the big buzz is big data. And it's uh, something like computational positivism. Now computer technology is at a stage where there are enormous quantities of data, humongous quantities of data can be processed within a very manageable time. And there are many, especially in Silicon Valley, who think that a revolution is taking place. The way we will get knowledge in coming years is going to be different. There's a book called The Fourth Paradigm. I'm sure all the computer scientists here will have seen it, which says we've been introducing a new thing now, a new way of making knowledge. So, there have been previous occasions in history where, where computation, progress in computation changed the way we looked at knowledge. I think one happened, I think, 400 years ago, when ideas about uh, the Indian numeral system, algebra, and so on, uh, began to be mixed with the Greek idea of axioms and uh, universal principles. The Babylonians were doing computing before the Greeks did. So, is it possible? See, this is what I consider the checkered history of computational positivism. There have been cycles. Is it possible that we are in another cycle now? I don't know. But uh, what we do know is that with big data, huge quantity, that's what Google and so on do all the time. They do it for commerce. But maybe you can do it for science too. What we do know is that uh, compute reliable correlations, very fast. Far faster can be than causal links can be established if you have a new phenomenon. So I would say it's no, so it may be no surprise the variant of computational positivism, it's not going to be exactly the same, is going to return to the world of science. But I think it will be one of the many methods that uh, we will use. We have not given up theory, we will not give up computations. We will not give up, uh, you know, observation. I think uh, this thing, uh, these ideas about one single absolute method of doing science will slowly disappear. That's what I think will happen. Thank you very much. So we have just about enough time for a couple of questions. So whoever wants to ask a question, please announce your name and also say where you are from. Make the question very crisp. Yeah. I'm Dr. Murali. Um, I'm affiliated with St. John's College, Cambridge, but I'm now mostly an independent researcher from Chennai. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick point regarding, uh, for a very long time until I think late 18th century or mid 18th century, but the term Brahmins was used by most Europeans. The term what? The term Brahmins was used by most Europeans right. to include all the learned people that they came across. Right, right. So this, I'm making this clarification because I don't want the leftists, some, I mean, this going into the years of leftists and saying that, oh, okay, Brahmins kept it all to themselves kind of thing. For example, we still have a tradition in Tamil Nadu that the Valdivar community, which belongs to the SC community, is who, I mean, which community does yeah. the astrology, sure. to which even Brahmin families go to, actually. So, so you know. I was quoting Playfair. Pardon me? I was quoting Playfair. So you please send your yeah, comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, no, no. Playfair. Playfair. I, have, I know about Playfair. It's in Dharampas yeah. as well. So yeah, yeah. I told, I'm not critiquing you. Yeah. Sorry. Just for a No, it was, you're quite right. I agree. Yeah. Sorry for that. But I think that uh, whatever they learned, whatever they learned on astronomy, yeah. 
They learned from discussions with Brahmin Pandits. That didn't mean that other people didn't have it in India. So I think we'll have only two more questions. Anyway. <coughs> one question from behind and one question from somewhere here. Yes. <coughs> Sir, uh, were the ancient Indian... Okay, I'm Shokumar. I'm doing PhD in EC department in IASC. Uh, were the ancient Indian mathematicians and astronomers aware of Greek work in mathematics and astronomy? And also you had mentioned that the Greeks had contact with the Babylonians. Sorry? The Greeks had contact with the Babylonians, yeah. the Babylonian astronomy. Similarly, did Greeks have any idea about the Indian work in mathematics and uh, geometry? Yeah. Well, I do think that there were contacts between the uh, Indians and the Greeks. Um, but they were not very intimate. You know, Alexander was here around the third century BC. And uh, he left a Greek kingdom there. Well, it uh, lasted some centuries. Uh, so, a certain contact between the Indians and the Greeks was always there. It's quite possible that the idea of epicycles came that way, although I'm not absolutely sure about exactly how it came. But I don't think the contacts, however, were very close. Uh, were, were not about detail, but about tools which Indians could find useful. Uh, in any case, after a certain time, I think it became autonomous, even if there had been some ideas which had come in from there. Why do I say that? Uh, you see, look at the differences. The differences in view, approach, are uh, large. They're, they're not small things. So I'd make a distinction between some tools which diffused, maybe like epicycles, but certain other ideas which did not diffuse. I think it's the same way, the opposite way too. In other words, there were some contacts, but they were not very close contacts. Now, the Greeks, similarly, knew that uh, the Indians knew something. If you read uh, Plutarch, and uh, uh, you read uh, how he describes what happened when Alexander came to India, it's very interesting. Uh, there were philosophers who came with Alexander, because they had heard about Indian philosophy. And they wanted to meet Indian philosophers. And there is even a description of a dialogue between Indian philosophers between an Indian philosopher and a Greek philosopher. That is now the centuries before Christ. And it's clear that the, the Greeks thought the Indians are very clever. It's philosophers now. I, I, there's, no, there's no discussion there about astronomy. <laughs> so this is only about philosophy. It's very interesting to read. Uh, the Greek asks uh, cleverly uh, posed questions. And the Indian, asks, uh, the Indian answers with uh, equally clever replies. <laughs> I'm not sure that they learned a great deal from each other. But, uh, but these contacts have been there, no doubt. And later on, there was that ambassador who, le who, le who, who was left in India after, the, after Alexander withdrew. So there have been some contacts. I would say the contacts were casual and had to do with tools best rather than deeply philosophical. I don't think the Indians uh, accepted Greek philosophy if they found it. I think maybe Professor Jav can tell us that. The, the, the outsider's view, the, the, <laughs> the amateur's view I have is this. If you look at uh, reasoning based on hypotheses and so on, the Indian philosophical texts, they're quite clear. They're not, they're not really going to go very far with that sort of approach. So I think that uh, there were philosophical differences. And uh, India had a very diverse philosophy. Six systems, including materialist ones which were not included in that list. So, so we'll have our last question. Uh, last question. Uh, good morning. My name is Nagbushan Rao, <coughs> software engineer interested in uh, philosophy. First of all, thanks a lot for a very enlightening lecture. My question is this. Uh, there was a mention of uh, what to do in case there is a difference between Shruti and uh, on one side, our own experience analysis. My opinion is that we need to understand Shruti more clearly, our interpretation rather than saying the Shruti is wrong, is my opinion. I just want to know what your opinion is. Well, uh, <clears throat> that's what I was trying to say. Uh, you see, it's a, it's a very interesting view among Indian scientists. <coughs> Uh, the clear, you know, the, 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 there's been an old distinction made. 
between two kinds of knowledge, Vyavaharika and Paramahatika. Right? Now, a given Indian scientist may know both. In fact, quite often they did. Nilakanta is a good example. Nilakanta on the one side says, you know, this is from Yukti and Nadagama. On the other side, he was known as the Shaddarshana Parangata. Shaddarshana Parangata. And in the book he writes, called the Jyotir Mimamsa, in fact, I was introduced by Professor Srinivas to that book. I learned a great deal from it about why, how Indians think. Because uh, he, has no, he has no hesitation quoting uh, the Upanishads on some philosophical issues. Therefore, I think the view that uh, the Indians, and Charaka is the same way. Uh, if you look at uh, some, of these uh, some of these scientists, it's clear that as far as the science was concerned, that they quite often followed Sankhya. See, the, the, you know, the, the, the Sankhya also has a somewhat similar view. Charaka, for example, speaks, speaks about uh, Sankhya philosophers surrounding Agdivesha. Surrounded by Sankhya philosophers, not by, not by the other schools. And in Sankhya, there is a school which is Nirishwara, okay. non-theist. Are they atheists? They are not atheists. But their view is, you know, there is not enough evidence. <laughs> Pramana Bhavat. You ask them, is there God? They say, well, we can't say. There is not enough evidence to decide one way or the other. They take a neutral view. And so, in a, in a certain way, because of this primacy for observation, which in philosophy might, might include observation of yourself, you know, your inner self and so on, they were willing to live with doubt. Not Aristotle, you see, that's the point. It's not, the Indians did not take the view that either there has to be, there has to be God or there is no God. There was a school which said, you know, sorry, on this evidence I can't decide. It's not relevant for me, therefore as I can't decide. I think uh, some uh, regarding the Agamas or the scriptures and uh, calculation and observation, I think many scientists took that view. Quite often the same scientist may be a priest in a temple. He kept his science truly rational and if there was uh, something which uh, the Spruti might have said, uh, the Shruti might have said, which was opposite, uh, he would have said, as far as my predictions are concerned, this is what I prefer. But very few of them were anti-scriptures. They, they were not anti-scriptures, they were not materialists. See, the initial materialist school in uh, India, there was one. Yeah, Charvakas. They disappeared. They, they, they ceased to be effective. Partly because I think many people saw that that was not that would not be taken seriously. But the Sankhyas were taken very seriously. The Sankhyas had the right mix, I would say. And if you read the Sankhyas, and if you read uh, some of the European scientists, the Sankhyas were uh, you know, much more rational, I would say, than, uh, than European scientists of that time. The kind of uh, difficulty that Galileo went through, for example. And uh, there was even that man, I've forgotten his name, who was actually executed for his uh, beliefs. Bruno. Huh? Bruno. Bruno, exactly. Bruno, that's right. Yeah, that sort of thing has never happened in India. I don't know whether that's an answer. It's a kind of Sankhya type answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You would all agree with me that we had a wonderful beginning to this seminar on science and technology in the Indic tradition. Uh, when Professor Narsimha started talking about logical positivi positivism, I was uh, thinking about big data analytics and data science. It is remarkable that his last two slides were actually on big data analytics and uh, data science. We must salute the energy and enthusiasm of the 84-year-old Professor Rodam Narasimha. <clears throat> we must give him a standing ovation. And the energy and enthusiasm he has shown.
and the way and the way he has prepared the slides so diligently like a fresh phd student of indian institute of science so on that note let's thank uh, professor narasimha for a wonderful lecture and here is a here is a very small gift but with a very big heart thank you very much and thank you for your very kind for me and thank you all coming here in this discussion thank you very much okay so in the in the interest of time uh, the coffee break is going to be only for 15 minutes we reassemble here at 11:30 uh, please uh, charge yourself for two excellent talks that are going to follow uh, the next talk will be on navya nyaya by professor jha and following that we'll have a talk by professor md shrinivas on indian mathematics and astronomy uh, so we'll have this session from 11:30 to 1:30 the lunch session will be at uh, 1:30 and uh, uh, i would like to warmly welcome you all for a cup of coffee and tea in the reception hall there thank you